I'll be on. Thank you. Members, apologies for absence. We have, we have received apologies for absence from Councillor David Merrick, Councillor Lisa Newport and Councillor Carol Weston and Councillor Lawman. Wait a minute, sorry, I can't hear her. And Councillor Eves. Oh, I'm sorry, we just now received uh, apologies for Councillor Eves. Councillor Mrs Mason is substituting for Councillor Lisa Newport and Councillor Constable is substituting for Councillor Weston. We have non-members attending is Councillor Cheryl Rowe and Councillor Simon Wooten. Anyone else? Thank you. Members, minutes of the meeting held on the 26th of October 2021. Are they agreed, members? Agreed. Thank you. <coughs> Item five, to receive declarations of interest. Have we any? Oh, I've got two. Councillor Williams. Daniel, Councillor FD, can you pass the mic? Thanks to my assistant. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I have a non-pecuniary interest in item number six, being that I'm a member of the Rochford Parish Council and I'm also known to the architect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Efty. Again, item six, uh, Rochford Parish Councillor. I don't know the architect. Thank you very much. Have we got any other declarations of interest? No, thank you, members. Item six is the... Um, 68 to 72 West Street, Rochford, to consider an application to demolish an existing building and erect a part two and three storey building comprising retail restaurant units at ground four floor together with self contained flats above 29 flats to include cycle store and car park. Car parkings to the rear and vehicular in access to West Street. I believe Mike Stranks is going to do it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this application, as we can see on the screen, is in Rochford Town Centre at the junction of uh, Union Lane, which gives access to the hospital, West Street, which leads off the Market Square, Bradley Way to the south here. Marlborough Pub is a landmark and the Sainsbury's building here. It's a, a prominent site in the conservation area. If we could look at Plan 2, please. Before we look at the detailed plans, there's a very useful visual being prepared, 3D image. Um, it gives us a, a context here. We see the adjoining restaurant listed building onto West Street, um, uh, the Krusty Pipe uh, uh, restaurant. We have the more modern Sainsbury's building on the corner here. While we're in this image, this is particularly good to show the uh, shopfront details to the two retail restaurant units. Um, you'll see they mirror the kind of treatment architecturally that was given to the Sainsbury's building on this prominent corner. Um, the proposal, as the description says, is to demolish the existing buildings on the site, which are former um, showrooms and uh, vehicle garages, and indeed is used currently by a company who service and repair um, cars, and to construct a three-storey building, which we see in a moment, um, that is, is three storeys, uh, but has some rooms um, in, in the roof. You'll see that the development from the description comprises 12 one-bedroom flats, 16 two-bedroomed and one three-bedroom flat, 29 in, up in total um, and with 21 car parking spaces including one for the um, impaired. And as we said earlier, it also includes two commercial uh, units onto West Street. If we could see plan three, please. This plan you'll see shows the building before you tonight in the dark outline here. This is a street scene view taking us from the flats through the entrance to their car park and the back of the Sainsbury's. This is the Sainsbury's building. Then we have Union Lane. Then we have the subject building tonight. Then the continuation of the uh, north side of West Street frontage. And the lower um, elevation, you see the junction point here. Um, the buildings opposite West Street. This is the return frontage onto Union Lane. So this is the Union Lane public frontage. This is the West Street frontage, the junction of, of Union Lane there. It's a, the site is a key arrival point in the Rochford Town Centre 
area action plan. Sometimes people refer them to as gateways. Um, and therefore it requires an important building of significant presence and built form. The proposal has been finally revised. You'll see in the report that it's been subject to quite extensive revisions, particularly following the concerns expressed earlier by the County Council's specialist advisors on listed buildings and urban design. And you'll see characteristic of Rochford, and that was employed on the Roach Close development some years ago. One of the features of Rochford Town is the assemblage of different built elements. A bit like you might say built as a Lego set where you add on, yeah? You get smaller sort of cottage-like elements and other buildings, and then they seem to have neighbouring buildings. And you can see an element of this here, and it's been replicated to some extent on the, on the Sainsbury's building. But members familiar with Rochford will note that point, that it's like several blocks put together. And the architect has picked up on that local distinctive theme. And although this is a new building before you, given all the texture in materials and the roof, uh, different roofing materials and the designs, to us it looks like a collection of buildings put together, which is very, very Rochford. Um, as I say, it has a good design, recognised in the local context, um, and the settings that are required. The building next door is a listed building, uh, and there are a number of listed buildings elsewhere in the town. Um, the palette of materials is textured render, uh, black feather edge weatherboarding, brickwork, timber sash windows, clay paint tiles to the roof and slate to other elements of the roof. It does include false chimneys and some members familiar with the previous appeal decision will remember that the inspector in one of the dismissed appeals took issue with the false chimneys as not being architecturally necessary. Um, but this architect has gone back to them and you'll notice that the Roach Close development where the supermarket used to be, that also includes false chimneys. And whilst in this room we will know they're false, I think when you appreciate the design, to us I think they're worth having, even though very few people will realise they don't, they don't work, they're just, just cosmetic. Um, so it's put together and subject to final control over the uh, details of the materials, officers are um, quite content with the design. Now you'll see from the other elevations here, this is the back end into the courtyard. You'll see in a moment the um, car parking areas. But this is the reverse of the building um, that you'll see actually, I, I think I said earlier it was three storeys with rooms in the roof, but, which would make it four, but you'll see this is four storeys. One, one of the um, legacy of this is this application started with some four-storey element and has been revised down. You'll see it's been with us some time. So there's been various revisions, so it's now three storeys, mostly two, but with rooms in the roof elements to some of the pieces that you'll see. Um, it works out at what you might think is quite a high density, 169 units per hectare, but if you think of when you get a subdivision of a garden and one bungalow, say, put in it, when you're only measuring the site, that density per hectare is quite high. So yes, it's a high dense scheme, but you'd expect that in a town centre Densities really work when you're dealing with bigger sites, say like 30 acre fields, a bit like we had in Hall Road, um, when you really need to wrestle with the, the density more. One of the key tests is if it, if it meets the standards that you have, um, then the density has got to be right. So it would see, re, re, achieve full compliance with the national technical standards for rooms and growth size. Officers consider there is a healthy uh, dwelling mix of one and two bedroom flats, which meets the demand in your housing needs survey. Um, you'll see that on affordable housing, there is no affordable housing in this scheme. And rather interestingly, the applicant um, put forward a viability assessment, which they're required to demonstrate why they can't provide affordable housing. And we go to the district valuer, an arm of the uh, civil service, and they have a private commercial arm that do these assessments. And you'll see from the report that they use two different models. The applicant used one model and came out that he didn't need affordable housing. The district valuer used a different model and actually that worked out more in the applicant's favour. So it's quite clear that the, by the time you've had the construction costs, by the time you've dealt with the decontamination of the site, given the history, it isn't viable if the site then includes affordable housing, and hopefully that's made clear in the report. Um, there's an element of, of concern, I think, that it'd be a loss of a community facility because of the existing garage and business that's run on the site, which has been quite popular. The policy you have arg arguably looks to make sure that things like public halls and public spaces are not lost. Um, 
what is on the site at present is a private business. It might be well patronised, but it is a private business um, that operates from the, from the site. If we can jump to the plan five, please. We'll be able to see here in a moment the, that's it, there we go, thank you. The uh, floor plans, you'll see that the access comes in where the car wash um, used to be and adjoining the listed building which is on this corner. It also achieves a nice gap between built form, which is two storey, to that listed building. Again, it was a feature in a previous appeal um, where the inspector dismissed the appeal for development on the whole site, but mainly because of the impact upon the windows to the flat above here in the listed building. So this design respects that. You'll see in the report there was an earlier scheme with more flats that um, came in off Union Lane, and that's why there's references to that and talking you through all that down to the scheme you now have before you, which included three uh, units, including this one here, but in the revisions the applicant dropped one of the commercial units, made that flats, and leaves the two units commercially proposed in this part. The access comes in to the rear here, and you'll see that there's some undercroft parking in this part, rather again like they've got at um, Roachfort House in Roach Close, where you park underneath. So at the upper floor level, you've got the projection of the flats, but at ground floor, you'd be able to park underneath. So this is, if you like, on piers and supports to cover the uh, car parking underneath. Um, on terms of car parking, though the starting point for this number of flats elsewhere in the district would amount to 58 spaces, sorry, 54, 54 spaces including eight visitor spaces, the council's standard allows for a reduction in parking provision where, like this, you're in a town centre where you're close to shops and services, you've got a mainline railway station within a very short walk, you've got regular bus services. The argument being that a scheme like this, centrally located, reduces dependency on the car. So for 29 flats here, you have 21 car parking spaces, including one disabled space. So it doesn't work out at one space per every flat, but you'll see that the county council's highways uh, technicians have had a look at this application, they've studied the information submitted by the applicant, and they agree that in this case, um, the amount of provision provided is acceptable. <coughs> In terms of amenity space, members will note that there isn't much provision. There's a couple of small patio areas to these two ground floor flats. But you'll again be aware that your standard says where the site adjoins, and that may be a key point as to adjoining, but where it adjoins an er area of open space, that can again be relaxed. Now in this case, across the crossing just here and over the road is the uh, adjoining the freight house, the Rochford Reservoir, public open space, well landscaped, large area, attractive area. Officers consider that in this case, that close proximity offsets the need for individual garden spaces, um, with the exception of those two provided. Um, so, in a nutshell, the mat matter of developing the site, getting rid of an unsightly building, enhancing the conservation area by the design, overcomes those failings and the recommendation is approval subject to the conditions set out in the report. Thank you. There are no pub public speakers for this item. Will councillors, uh, Councillor James Gooding, Councillor Mike Stepter and Councillor Williams. Um, so I'm going to ask Councillor Williams if... Sorry, uh, Councillor Rowe, have you got to say anything? Councillor Wooten, thank you. Councillor Williams, being the Wall Councillor. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, this site's well known to me. It's been in, a, it's been in an untidy state for many years now. Um, and I, I do, actually, I, I will support this application. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I absolutely agree that this is what uh, Mr. Strang's described as a, as a gateway site. Um, I just wonder if you could just clarify a couple of things to me. Um, and that is the classification of the retail that is on the site. And then just could, to, to confirm the protection that we have in the retention of the retail 
should uh, an alternative application be put forward, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm assuming you're, I'm being asked about the proposed retail units as opposed to the workshops that are... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's interesting because in days gone by, retail and restaurants were in different what we call use classes, a bit like football leagues. When you, you change from one use into another, you would need planning permission. It would become before this committee probably or in the weekly list. And you have policies about safeguarding the various frontages in the town. More recently, the government has amalgamated the town centre use classes into one, um, if you like, created a super league. And with the exceptions of pubs uh, and takeaways, restaurants and retail are now in one general class E. So we'd have to have a good reason to say we wish to retain the building as a retail use. It might be the desire and the, the policies you have are somewhat out of date in context of the use classes order um, because the amendment, I think, was only in 20, 2020, possibly this year. But we can't, we, we haven't got the discretion of refusing permission for non-retail uses that we used to enjoy. So that's why I think the applicant has presented the application as they have, saying it's going to be restaurant or retail use. Um, because then they can go to the market and see who will take it. Now, we live in times where sort of retail is on its knees. Um, so I think we're fortunate to see here that the applicant has put in commercial space into the uh, ground floor and on a prominent corner to continue that frontage and footfall down to uh, Sainsbury's. The, I think the economic development team are quite excited about that, that feature, hence their support. But if I'm being asked how we can make sure it stays retail and doesn't become restaurant or some other use in Class E, um, we don't have that control that we used to have. And I think if, you was, if it made a difference to you that between approving and refusing this, you were, you were wanting retail, and therefore you felt, well, rather than refuse it, we could impose a condition, um, I would say that condition may be, may be challengeable, but um, it's in the gift of this committee. Thank you. Thank you. I have one question, and then it'll be Councillor Foster, Council, and then Councillor Stanley. Is there going to be any charging points on the site? Because we're all trying to go green, eco, etc. Chairman, there is a condition, I think, in the recommendation that asks for the provision. Sorry, of, um, I missed it. Charging I do apologise. Sorry, I do apologise. Councillor Foster, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I do have a concern about the parking. Uh, I do understand reducing the average per um, flat, uh, but going down f to 21 compared to 29 flats, and I understand all the push for alternative uh, means of transportation, but it strikes me that's going to be a, sense, a source of some tension, and I wonder whether eight of those flats, for example, would be sold with the condition that there's no parking provided. Thank you. Councillor Stanley, please. You all, oh, sorry, I do have to remind members we've all got five minutes and Sonia is timing us. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, three questions, or, or near enough three, it might be four. Um, on the parking, um, how many parking spaces does the three bedroomed flat have? Um, also, I'm particularly worried that we have planning policies in this council, and although the inspectors are happy with the arrangements that has been made by the uh, officers for the council, um, it seems as though our, our rules, if not rules, but our propositions that we put together are, are, are really now in jeopardy for, for developments in the future. Whereas there is no amenity space, and the amenity space, which is across the road, which uh, the inspector says they can use, uh, unfortunately, is, there's a great big lump of water over the other side of the road, so they can't use that water, basically. So the, the area being covered for sitting or playing isn't as much as that is proposed. 
Also, I'm concerned that we haven't got any um, arrangements for low cost living. Um, just because the site has to be uh, some of the soil or whatever it is, contamination, whatever you like to call it, that's down to the developer. If he wants to build there, that's fine. That doesn't come into the restrictions of how much, why we haven't got um, this availability. So I, I really do think that this is, it's a nice development. I'm not saying it isn't nice, but the parking, we've got parking standards. We also, I can't see any reason why, because it's over, I think it's over 15 units, isn't it, that they have to provide uh, um, this standard that we that we want. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but I believe it is. Um, so why aren't we why aren't we upholding our policies <coughs> as much as what we should do? Thank you very much. Do you want to come back? Thank you, Chairman. Um, firstly, I'm not an inspector yet. It's um, <laughs> planning officers, but I take I take the point. Um, you asked, firstly, how many parking spaces a three-bedroom flat would require. The answer is 2.25. Two for the number of bed spaces for the occupiers, 0.25, a quarter of a space for visitors. And in a scheme like this, the quarters increment up into complete spaces, and you round up to the, to the highest point. That is the standard that you start with. But what your policy also says that it may be reduced as you get closer to the services and things. Therefore, the idea being by the county council who produce the um, standards in conjunction with input from district councils and, and specialists as well, that you reduce the need of dependence on the car. So let's say if this scheme was on Fowness Island somewhere where you barely see a bus, you'd probably be insistent on the 50-odd spaces that this would require. But if you put this in, say, Rayleigh Town Centre or Rochford Town Centre, you would be looking to say, well, do we need all those spaces? And your standard says you can, you can push those down. Now, in dealing with the planning application, we consult Essex County Highways. And although I think this, this committee is perhaps tired of finding the county do not object, what actually happens is that the architects, before the council sees it, they go and approach the county council because what the last thing they want to do is for the county council to object to, not only waste their time, but, but lead to the whole thing failing. So they go and do their research and find out what may be accepted. Now, I don't know if in this case they did that, but it's quite common practice for developers to look at the car parking they need and that technically would be accepted. So as, as planning officers, we've asked the county council for review, we've consulted them, and they've said the provision of the 21 spaces, including one disabled, is good enough for members of this committee to approve the application. So you have a policy that says a certain number, but that policy also says that can be reduced in central locations like this. And that's why the recommendation on parking is the way it is. In terms of amenity space, there's a similar argument that in town centre locations, you've got access Yes, there's a lovely waterscape there, and I get it that you can't play games, as it were, but you get the amenity of that waterscape. There's the animals, the wildlife, the pleasure of walking alongside water. There's quite a large open space there, and where they would have done, dug the second reservoir if steam had continued, there is a flat, um, grassed area that gives opportunity to sit, to play, or whatever. So officers are saying, yes, in the perfect world, you might have amenity space, you can have balconies and things like this to achieve that. But this site is right close. If somebody needs to get out, get some fresh air, go for a walk, they're, they're literally a couple of minutes away from a quite a large, attractive open space. And that, again, like with the car parking, brings the standard down. And finally, on affordable housing, um, members are right that Rochford's policy says for 15 or more you need to be looking for 35%. The government actually says for schemes of 10 or more you need to provide uh, whatever's agreed, uh, um, I think it's one, one unit or whatever. So between 10 and 15 you'd, you'd get one. But it's subject to a viability test. 
unlike the highways authority that sometimes say we need this much money for roundabouts or junction improvements and things like that, it's a costed project. The government has said that the affordable housing provision can be subject to viability. So that if a developer has a site and it's going to cost a lot of money to just get started, then if the profits of that development are going to be eaten into by 35% affordable housing, it ceases to be a project that they would build. They wouldn't get a satisfactory return of probably more than 17% interest back on what they're paying out. So it becomes unviable, it's not worth them doing. And in this case, the applicant has done an assessment, what we call a viability assessment, and his consultants used a certain model. And what we need to do, and we've done, is then have that tested by, if you like, our consultants, and we're quite happy and comfortable using the district valuer. They have a commercial arm, as I explained. Now, on this occasion, the district valuer uses a different model to what the applicants have, and the district valuer has found it's even more unviable than the applicant thought it was by their testing. So you've got double proof that on this occasion, given the contamination on the site and the construction, the complexities, etc., that it, the sums just don't add up, that if they've then got to provide 35% affordable housing, it's not viable. And the government says that where these schemes have that uh, lack of viability, you can dispense with affordable housing. Professionally, as officers, we're not happy about that because I think we all know in this room the need for affordable housing. But the government's rules are that if the viability assessment is proven that they cannot sustain the contribution of affordable housing, then as a council, we can grant permission without that. And that, I think, is set out in some detail in the report as to why on this occasion no affordable housing can be provided. I think that's the three questions, Chairman. Okay. I've got, I've got um, have you got a quick, can I just go through them all? Uh, Councillor Mrs Mason first, then Councillor FD. You've got a club. Ah, wait, everyone's coming, mate. <coughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. I could never tell if these are one or not. Right, I, I'm going to come back slightly on the amenity space, but from a rather different perspective. I, I accept the officer's uh, comments about the amenity space nearby because I know the area. But an amenity space is not just play space and recreation space. It's also used in a more practical sense and I have some experience of rented accommodation and the potential issues arrive, that arise when an outside drying area is not provided. The tendency then is for washing to be dried indoors, which often creates a mould damp issue, or alternatively for someone to use a tumble dryer, which is expensive and obviously um, not very carbon friendly, shall we say, as we look in the Greek. So I just wondered, I, I noticed there's a very small amenity space there. If it would be possible to add a condition on um, that there's an outside washing line provided, would that be possible and would it be acceptable to other members? Thank you, Chairman. Just checking with the author of the report, who's more familiar than this than me. Um, the, the problem would be about in, ensuring joint access, because the, the area to the, the back of the, the site is, is communal. I think we're talking here. The bin, sto the bin store is in here, and the cycle racks are here. So logically, it'd probably be somewhere about here. Um, if, if it makes a difference to members, then we could put a, a condition on. Um, but I think it goes back to the idea that I accept some people are perhaps to some extent forced, somewhat forced by price to live in certain areas and they can't get everything that they want. But when people are looking to either take these if they're for rent or to buy them, they would know what they're buying in terms of there isn't this, there isn't that. Perhaps in the case of some flats, there isn't a parking space. That might suit some people's uh, standard of living. They may have dispensed with the car, they may not be drivers. Um, same as people with high uh, washing 
uh, from the, you know, if you've got a young family or perhaps a baby in, in the household, would they purchase this if they're not satisfied with, with the drying area? But if members are, uh, if it makes a difference to members that there's an essential need for some form of communal drying area, um, there may be some limited scope in this uh, area here. Would you say, Arwa? Oh, well, somewhere about there, a bit of open space? Does that? There. But that's, that's private for those two, isn't it? Can we just put it as a condition? Um, well, well you, you could put it in condition, which is what I was speaking to, but the, the problem is, and the debate we're having amongst ourselves, if you forgive us, is you know, just where would it go? They've got a car park there, you've got fumes of cars and things like this. Um, you know, would it be the sort of thing that they might put in to meet the condition, but then nobody ever used because of its location? You know, there's surely that would be down to the optical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to support Councillor yeah. Mason on this one. We've, we've discussed washing lines on, on, on previous occasions. And although I won't uh, claim to be any expert on washing myself, I think in the world we're in, every little touch we can do towards a bit of carbon neutrality and avoid the, the need for energy use on tumble dryers is a, uh, is, is a positive step forward. This is a relatively small thing, and I, I'm, I'm quite sure that you'll be able to work with the applicant to come up with some satisfactory, simple, um, but usable solution for, for this application. So um, if, if Councillor Mason would like to just move that as a small amendment, yes, um, as an additional condition, I, I would be happy to support that. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Yes, I'd be more than happy to. It's not just the carbon neutral, it's also, I've seen the, the mould and damp that can be created in problems, and I think anything we can do to prevent that, because it's a health issue, we, we should be doing and it, it shouldn't be impossible to achieve so I'd like to move with the uh, committee's agreement that a condition is added that outdoor washing dry sorry washing <laughs> drying <laughs> facilities is uh, are provided and it's up to the applicant I think to ascertain where and how I second right. that please. Can, as members is everyone in agreement that we they put, have a condition on there for a washing line please Yep. No. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Councillor FD. Thank you, Chairman. Um, a talking agreement on this. Um, the planner has discussed the contamination, the parking, the social, has uh, social aspect of this. Um, this is a gateway into Rochford, and the way it is at the moment, it's a right mess. And I feel that I add my support to this application. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stanley, <coughs> and then Councillor Williams, and I think we've had a good discussion. Th thank you, Chairman. Uh, just getting back to the uh, uh, principles and the policies that we have already got, will this become, um, uh, again, will this become what the planners have so rightly said in the way of bringing down the parking and also the um, non-affordable housing because we do need affordable housing and I feel that because even though the site is probably contaminated and what have you there's, there's, there must be room for one or two units to be affordable if, if, we, if we do not have affordable housing, we will never get affordable housing on these, on these restrictions that we're putting together. Chairman, I think you've had, please, yeah. been asked and answered. I think, I say, yeah. Councillor Stanley, I think uh, Mike what Frank I mean, is it, is it going to be a, a principal thing in future, in future uh, developments? President. President, sorry. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we've already had the Would you like to come back? Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, uh, members actually used the word precedent which is what it is, and the members are right, that examples of development can act as it, um, serving to say, you know, an approval here where there's not the full compliance with car parking. In Rochford Town Centre, you've actually got a number of schemes where there's been flats converted and no parking provided, or less than. On the weekly list yesterday, cleared one for the site of the uh, former new ship, yeah? 
um, and there is, le there is not full compliance on, I think it was the White Horse scheme that was demolished. So, uh, and you probably recall some in Rayleigh where parking has been provided but not fully to your standard as if it was in a remote area. The thing to think of is if concentric rings, if it's out in the rural areas you need all the car parking. As you get closer to the centre, then you could need possibly none at all. But I know members are not totally comfortable with that. On the affordable housing, that's not the case. On the affordable housing, you get these viability assessments that look at the economies of the um, site and the development being proposed, and they do the maths and say, will this work? Yeah. So um, it's not a precedent as much that the uh, this is a case where the affordable housing is waived. It can happen on any site anywhere depending on the circumstances. Uh, it's just the way the sums and the economics of it all have worked out for this scheme. Yeah? Hopefully Thank that you. helps you. But the last question I'll take next, I think we've had a very good debate on this, is Councillor Williams, and then we'll go to a vote. Uh, thank you. Not a question. Um, I know the area very well. I've lived in Rochford for many years. This site is in desperate need of, of, of um, improvement. It really is in an awful state. Um, most of the houses around this area don't have um, open spaces. There are many flats up back lane, up West Street, that are just um, just accommodation with very little. So that is of little concern, considering that we have um, our, our own reservoir, the, the open space, right opposite, almost immediately opposite, within a couple of minutes walking, as the officer said. Um, there are three car parks, large car parks, within two minutes walk. Uh, we have our own car park back lane, our own car park, which is the freight house and also the British Rail car park, all within, I would say, a maximum of two minutes walk. Um, in any other place, I would be really concerned regarding the parking issues, but where this one is, I certainly wouldn't. And, Chairman, thank you. I would like to propose that this is recommended with Mrs. Mason's, Councillor Mrs. Mason's um, amendment to the um, proposal. Thank you. Has, have Thank we you. got a seconder for this, please? Oh, we've got right. <laughs> Councillor Butcher. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Members, can we please vote? Um, put your hand up and keep it up until Sonia's uh, said we'll put it down. And this is to vote to accept with the condition from Councillor Mrs. Mason. Members for acceptance. Unanimous. It's unanimous. Thank you very much, members. And you can take your hands down. There you go. Councillor Mrs Mason, have you had time to read the addendum, please? Thank you very much. Right. Item 7, members, is for South Banbridge. And if I can find the... Well, uh, South Banbridge... Agenda item 7, South Banbridge Hall, Banbridge Road, South, Fram, South Banbridge. We've all read the uh, addendum. And again, it's uh, Mike Franks to present the officer's report. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, there is some difficulty with this one in as much that the plans we have might not quite fit the screen. So I'd ask members to, to bear with us because this is a, a big site. Um, it's of some 164 acres or 66 or more hectares of land spread over five fields at South Fanbridge Hall. Here we have the Fanbridge Road leading down to the settlement and the river off, off the map here. And there's the farmhouse and buildings uh, at this point and it concerns the fields primarily to the east of that site. The River Crouch is up here roughly on this scale. Um, but it also includes a parcel of land uh, on the western side of the road, which will become uh, self-explanatory in a moment. The proposal, as you see, is for a solar farm and uh, with all the screens and uh, panels laid out here and for uh, a battery storage facility and transformer um, beside, the, beside the road there with ease of access. Um, there's also, just off the screen, and I think we'll see a better plan later, but there's an existing solar farm that was approved, I think, in 2014, which is here. And you'll see members familiar with that. You'll see the comparison between that one, which is about that size on the scale, compared to this, which is about five times larger than before you tonight. Um, the site would be contained within security fencing, but with mammal access points, with sort of like depressions under them in parts of badges and the like. Um, can freely move about the site. If we could jump to plan two, please. This shows you two arrangements. They're um, located on a frame, 
and for the most part of the site, the I think the height is 2.3 or 2.6, 2.6, thank you. Um, but there's an area of flood uh, risk, which you'll see on the final plan I show you, where because of the flood risk, they're made slightly higher. I think, is it 3.2? Yeah. yeah. Yeah? So to combat the flooding concern, they're just lifted slightly out of that, out of that tidal uh, level. Um, underneath the panels that you saw would be sown wildflower meadow and that would allow sheep to graze so that the farmer could graze stock and get some income from that. It would help keep the uh, site in a semi-natural state um, and it would give him obviously the return from the livestock as well as uh, what they get from this. If we can jump to plan three please, this is the battery storage layout alongside um, we're going to have to perhaps shrink it down if you can a bit, Katie, thank you. Um, the battery storage area here, this is enlarged to this small area here, uh, and then the transformer that's necessary to do that. They are, batteries are contained in containers, and obviously um, some of the electricity, if we can see plan four, um, that gives you just a, a shot of a typical container that members are probably quite familiar with, just a, a utilitarian box. Um, but it's how these things work, <coughs> stored and are best kept. And then if we've got plan five, please, which is the compound elevation. Um, to some people like me, it's quite exciting, but to others, it's not the best thing, etc. But it's what it is. It looks the way it does because of the function that it performs. So uh, it has a functional appearance, and it's only a part of the, the greater use, but an essential part so that the power is transferred into the battery storages. As you've seen more recently at other um, committees, the battery storage is a way of um, capturing the surplus energy that's created through the panels, because obviously the panels would be working hardest when it's sunny and not so good when it's when the poor weather. Um, but it allows them capacity, otherwise the, the, the storage would be, would be lost. So it's increasingly more common to see battery storage facilities alongside this so that the energy that's been captured uh, can be used when the demand is, is at peak. If we can lastly look at plan six, please. This is the flood risk area I was talking to you about. You'll see that it uh, sort of seeps into, as it were, the layout of the, um, of the panels, which are all this sort of like series of lines. But it's in these darker shaded areas is where the panels would be that little bit higher just to keep them out of the predicted flood zone should the seawall breach or overtop. Members will know that the site is within the green belt and ordinarily um, this type of thing would not be appropriate development. Um, but the general thrust of national planning policy, however, strongly favours uh, the provision of renewable energy. And members will see that the harm to the green belt uh, would, in officers' view, be outweighed by the benefits of renewable energy. And as in this case, as you've heard before more recently, this area is good access to the national grid network. So the applicants in looking for a site have not been able to find somewhere with that access that's not in the green belt. So officers feel that the um, visual impact that will occur, the applicants are uh, looking to strengthen some of the hedgerows and the planting around the edges to provide screening from the outside, obviously so that it doesn't damage the performance of the panels. But that in turn also gives you ecological benefits. And members will be aware that it's not so much patches of, of ecological um, <coughs> planting, it's corridors which give wildlife the opportunity to move around and meet other members of the species, etc., as well as pollination and everything else. And the enhancement of the hedgerows and the, the field boundaries by the planting would help screen this, but would also enhance the ecology. And then there's the added advantage of the sea wall up here, it gives some screening uh, through the high, high level banking to users of the river. So when you're sailing on the crouch, it would be less easy to see because of the, um, because of the sea wall. But inside the sea wall, then you've got the benefit of the, the extra planting as well. The site is also on grade 3B, uh, which is a poor agricultural land, high concentration of clay, which makes it poorly draining and, and a sticky uh, texture and gives only moderate yields for cereals, oilseed, rape, winter beans, or grassland. So this is not prime agricultural land. Yes, it's been arably farmed, but to, to make a living from it in arable terms, it's a struggle. So 
uh, you won't be losing with this prime agricultural land. You'll see that they say a life expectancy of some 45 years with these things. And because of the nature, you will saw that they sit on the land, but there is underground cabling. It's quite not too much trouble to remove the apparatus and then remove the cabling with some hope of returning it back to agriculture. So it is it's somewhat reversible. Um, members will see on the addendum there's quite a, a number of matters. Firstly, um, there's an amendment to the Great Grested Newt condition. Since pending the report, the applicant has been able to provide survey data which identifies uh, two of the ponds on the site uh, could have the potential for Great Crested Newt. So you'll see there's a, re there's a revised condition seven um, that covers that. And then you'll see that we've been able to get a final response from the lead local flood authority that suggests the removal of condition 17, but the substitute with a new condition 17 on surface water drainage provision. And then I think it's three extra uh, conditions that the flood authorities seek, um, which you've seen on the, on the report, but one to minimise the off-site flooding, the other a maintenance plan for the uh, drainage system, and then the completion of yearly logs so that we can see that maintenance has been carried out. I think members have been familiar with that approach by the Lead Flood Authority before. So the recommendation, Chairman, is approval, subject to the conditions set out in the report, but as amended by those conditions on the addendum. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Ward Councillors are... Speaker. Have we got one? Yeah. Oh, sorry. We have a public speaker, the planning agent, Mr. Kenny Dillon, and you have five minutes, and I'll, I'll tell you when you've got a minute left. Thank you. Many thanks, councillors, for allowing me the time to present to you the benefits of our proposal. My name is Kenny Dillon, and I am the, di the director of the planning and landscape team at RSK ADAS. I have over 21 years' experience in planning across both local government and the private sector. The applicants are BSR, British Solar Renewables, who have been in the renewable energy sector for the last 15 plus years. The proposed development is for the construction of a 49.99 megawatt solar PV array with a 20 megawatt battery at South Vanbridge. The land on which the proposal will be built upon is low quality agricultural land and the submitted agricultural land report has found the entire site to be grade 3B, which is not considered the best or most versatile agricultural land. The development will provide power to at least 12,500 homes and will provide a saving of at least 11,072 tonnes of CO2 per year, which is a substantial reduction when you consider that the life of the development is in the region of 45 years. The proposed development represents an exciting project which will make a significant contribution to promoting renewable energy use and moving to a low carbon economy in support of national and local planning policy and all other material considerations. The site of the solar development was chosen due to its open nature and land area and the availability of a grid connection and the lack of any constraints and a willing, and a willing landowner. The site is within the green belt, however we have not been able to find any large brownfield sites within the district or within the near proximity of a viable grid connection to take the generation output of the proposal. We have submitted a very special circumstances case to the council and this outlines the significant benefits of the proposal. We have worked with the council to ensure that the site can also deliver a biodiversity net gain of over 58%, which is a significant betterment than the current state of the site. This proposal will also result in the planting of additional hedgerow and boundary planting to create new habitats and green corridors for wildlife, as well as to ensure the site is screened from, from, from distant and local views. The site, however, is already well screened given the proximity of the flood defence in the northern aspect of the site and the natural bowl in which the majority of the site sits within. So the main points of the site are is that the development will contribute towards a secure energy supply in the, in the UK while slowing down the negative impact of climate change. Solar farms such as this development present an ideal solution given the low maintenance costs and sound operation for this. 
Once operational, the site will encounter low levels of traffic with one or two visits per week for regular maintenance and inspection purposes only. Therefore, there will be no long-term operation changes occurring as a result of the development. The proposal will provide long and short-term job opportunities within the local area, making efficient use of underutilised area of agricultural land and will support the diversification of an existing agricultural business. The proposed development will also have a positive impact on the environment through the provision of biodiverse net gains within site. And renewable energy such as this, schemes such as this, will help in tackling climate change and the social issues that this causes too. The proposed development will lead to ensuring a secure supply of clean power into the local and regional electricity grid to ensure that there is power for people to heat their homes and businesses to run their machinery and computers. The proposed development is a type of development which our Prime Minister and the wider political landscape support. It will ensure that we as a nation are contributing to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and becoming a country which can aim to be self-reliant in, in, in electricity generation. We fully agree and support to work with the Council during the construction of the site and we consider that this scheme will be a landmark scheme and an excellent example of the best type of solar PV development in the region and that the Council should be very proud of this development. To recap, there are no objections from many statutory consultees, no objections from the Parish Council, and no significant objections from the local community. I respectfully request you that you please... Go, sorry, you have one minute to go, sorry. Thank you. I respectfully request that you please support this development and be proud in delivering an important and significant renewable energy generation scheme for your district and region. I thank you sincerely for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Visiting members, Councillor Orton, Councillor No. Wall Councillor, who we have here tonight is Councillor uh, Constable. Have, would you like to speak? Uh, I'll get your mic if I just nod if you do. I will, please. Right. Uh, Councillor Williams, please indicate it. And then Councillor Smith and Councillor. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, just a couple of questions, really. I presume that these are fixed panels and not the type that follow the sun, I, I presume. Um, I understand that there, are, there is already some solar panels in this area. Can, could the officer uh, point out roughly where they are at the moment, please? Just there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Uh, th thank you, Chairman. Um, we've got a very comprehensive report in, in front of us tonight, tonight and uh, I, I think it very clearly sets out very special circumstances which would allow this development to take place in the Greenbelt. Um, I think that it is highly appropriate for the district, and although we obviously are working on planning uh, conditions, I think that uh, this application does help us fulfill some of our ambitions as a council. We are very well protected by quite a wide range of conditions as set out in the report and in the addendum and I would actually be very happy straight away to move this, uh, the, this application for approval subject to the recommendations as printed on the report and in the addendum. Thank you. Have we got a second? Well, Councillor Foster, thank you. Members, we've now had the motion. Do I let the others speak? Let's, let's speak to yeah, the motion. Sorry, you can, I, uh, can you speak to the motion, Ms. Council, Mr. Mason, please? Yes, sir. Oh, you need a mic. I think I've got one. Is it on? I have no idea. Yeah, um, yes, I, I'd like a little bit of clarification. Um, I said this is a very good scheme, but there's two points that I'd like the officers to... Um, clarify before I make my mind up definitely. One, I haven't seen the battery store, if you could um, point that out again. I'm not sure if I've missed it in the report, but is there any screening of the containers or any screening of the battery store? Bearing in mind it's very visible location inland. And the second question I have is on page 7.9, it says solar farms are normally temporary structures and planning conditions can be used to ensure that these installations are removed when no longer in use and the land is restored to its previous use, which I understand. 
Um, and on page 711, again, it says 45 yeah. years. My recollection last time when I heard a, a similar application, it was, was the life of the solar panels was 25 years. So I don't know if technology has improved, but I am concerned about the disposal at the end of the site, and I don't know if that's covered in the conditions. I have looked, but forgive me if I've missed it. Perhaps the officers could clarify those two areas. If you could bear with us, Chairman, we're just looking for that condition. We, we, we think it's there, but we're trying to take members to it. On, uh, I could answer 7.3. There is um, the protection of, uh, tree protection barriers identified for the containers, etc. Uh, well, while uh, Councillor Mason, can I ask uh, Councillor Stanley, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, two things I've got concerns about. Um, the water runoff from the solar panels is a very, very big area. And the runoff from the solar panels, um, how is that being contained? Are there uh, attenuation tanks or something like that? Because obviously, if you've got the ground covered, which you have, the water can't get it, penetrate into the ground. It's going to run off from one to the other and, and so on very, very quickly. Also, um, the battery container store, has that got an, inten uh, an attenuation tank or some sort of uh, 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 means of collecting the water from that area? Sorry, Thank you. I thought you were a councillor now. No. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, there's no direct condition about screening of the uh, battery storage facility, but there is a general uh, landscaping condition that requires, and it's got that purpose about screening. We could extend that to um, cover the, the uh, battery storage facility in that area. Um, so that's that part. Condition 10 of the recommendation deals with the decommissioning. I can't help you with the life expectancy of the screens. I don't know if the panels can be replaced and sat on the same frames or whether, as members suggested, the technology is improved. But the applicant has, has it given, and you heard him say, um, a 45 years. So, so that's the content of the application and you've had that doubled up by the applicant. Um, in terms of the runoff, there's a condition in the addendum that deals with the surface water uh, management. And I would hope that that details for that condition uh, four of, sorry, um, 17, a revised 17, which I think you'll see was a, was a, a residential housing scheme one, which is why it's been changed. Um, condition 17 will deal with the, the runoff for those areas. And again, we could extend that to the battery storage facility. So I think that condition 17 as revised on the addendum, uh, would seek to address that issue raised. Thank you. Thank you. Right, members, we've had... Um, Could I just come back, Madam Chairman? OK. Could I just ask if Councillor Smith would be happy to have that, those... Um, Councillor Mason, Mrs Mason, can you bring the mic closer because you're quite softly spoken? Sorry. Can I just ask uh, Councillor Steve Smith if he'd be happy for the those two... Um, conditions to be extended to the battery store, the screening, and, think, and the water runoff. The two, the two that the officer said could be extended, is he happy for those to be extended? Um, the way I've, I've read the report myself, I, I found that the, the screening that is described was about all the various elements of the site, but if it helps to just specifically mention the um, the, the, the battery storage as well, and that doesn't in any way compromise any safety issues regarding that, then quite happy for that to go in. Uh, but I believe that the, the SUDS conditions, um, as, as outlined on the addendum, uh, satisfactorily deal, deal with that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you members. 
We'll go to the vote for acceptance, or a recommendation for acceptance. Can I please uh, have, put your hands up for acceptance, please? Is that unanimous? Please re uh, re put your hands down. Thank you, members. Thank you. Agenda 8 is the Mitchellian Farm Arterial Road. And Katie Rogers will present the officer's report. That will be up, Katie. Thank you, Chairman. So we'll show on screen um, the location plan, but this is it's not an application for planning permission. Is there a look? Yeah, okay. Um, so, Chairman, this application relates to a request to modify a legal agreement. The legal agreement relates to a planning consent for commercial development at the Michelin Farm site. So it's a site on screen, uh, edged red. The legal agreement contains a requirement that the developer pay a financial contribution to Essex County Council towards early years and childcare provision. Since the determination of the application to which the legal agreement relates, the County Council no longer seek financial contributions towards early years and childcare provision from commercial employment development. So whilst they still do in relation to um, residential schemes, they do not in relation to employment schemes. The County Council are therefore minded to agree the request to modify the legal agreement to remove the requirement for this contribution. And the recommendation is therefore that this Council also agree the proposed modification. Thank you. Thank you very much. We won't have any speakers on this, will we? Any visiting members? Either be no, thank you. I'll turn over. Oh, it would be Councillor Lorman. He's not here. So, um, from the chair, I move um, a motion to agree that we remove this uh, modification. If that's the right wording, have I got a second, please? Oh, Phil Shaw, Councillor Shaw, sorry, Mr Shaw. Members, can I uh, have a show of hands for voting in favour of this, please? It's unanimous, you can uh, put your hands up. Thank you, members, for a very good uh, meeting, very good debates, and I close the meeting at, I haven't got a close. 2033. Who? 2033, thank you very much. And if I don't see any any of you, have a good easy, uh, have a good Christmas. It's a bit chilly. <laughs>